Hawaii's number one industry is thriving. Nearly 10 million visitors per year spend nearly $18 billion. The industry employs more than 215,000, but not everyone is smiling. The beaches that I go to, like, I, I can't go to anymore just because of the overcrowding, and so I've always had to adjust. Many say the industry needs to be managed, but what does that mean? Join the conversation about managing tourism. Tonight's live broadcast and live stream of insights on PBS Hawaii start now. Aloha and welcome to Insights on PBS Hawaii, I'm Yanji Denise. A report released in February concluded that the current model for our tourism industry does not work. The report was issued by the Economic Research Organization at the University of Hawaii, or UHERO. It says what we all know, people are coming here in record numbers, but they're spending less, which decreases the economic benefit. The report cites surveys by the Hawaii Tourism Authorities that shows that community support for tourism has eroded, especially especially on the neighbor islands where there is a quote sense of conflict between tourism and community values. Our guests tonight include the head of the Hawaii Tourism Authority, a hospitality consultant, an economist and a community member. We look forward to your participation in tonight's show. You can email, call or tweet your questions and you'll find a live stream of this program at pbshawaii.org and on the PBS Hawaii Facebook page. Now to our guests. Chris Tatum is the president and CEO of the Hawaii Tourism Authority. He was appointed to the position last November after retiring from Marriott Resorts Hawaii. Keith Vieira is the principal of KV and Associates Hospitality Consulting. His clients include hotel owners in Hawaii and French Polynesia. Paul Brubaker is the principal of TZ Economics, an economics consulting for firm. He was previously the chief economist at Bank of Hawaii. And Lavani Lipton is the vice chair of the Kailua Neighborhood Board. She leads its committees on homelessness and water pollution. Welcome to all of you. Thank you for being here tonight. I know there are a lot of opinions on this topic. Topic. And Paul, I want to start with you. You're one of the authors of that report that we referenced, charting a new course for Hawaii tourism. Can you tell us briefly the findings of the report and what the finding, you know, uh, how we chart a new, how we chart a new course for Hawaii tourism? Sure. I wanted to clarify something about the uh, the introduction. The the point we were making and the reason we chose this particular time to make it is that. Tourism receipts have been about the same for 30 years. They've actually just gotten back to where they were about 30 years ago. But of course, the visitor count has gone up. And there's widespread perception of congestion and overuse of some of the uh, resource, natural resources that are available for recreational activities. And so, like I say, it was kind of the 30-year moment to look back and think about how we might change our approach to managing tourism. Um, to uh, you know, to help channel the economic benefits uh, more more securely for um, Hawaii, and and to mitigate and and you know reduce some of the uh, negative impacts that are associated with such large numbers of tourists. Chris, you've been on the job for five months yes. now. How do we chart that new course? You know, when I got on the job, the first thing I want to do is um, listen to uh, uh, all the stakeholders, including the community the industry. Um, obviously, I had my own personal opinions from someone who grew up here and has been in the industry for a fair amount of time. Um, I, you know, I, 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 I don't disagree with the idea that we've got, we definitely have to manage tourism. Um, it's important to Hawaii. It drives a lot of revenue. It pays for a lot of uh, important parts of our economy. Um, I think TAT revenue was up to 630 million last year. So it's important, it's an important part of our economy, However, um, if we want to have a long-term sustainable tourism, uh, we have to invest in our product and our experience. And that's really what our focus is, is going to be moving forward, is how do we do that? And the only way we can do is getting feedback from um, the community themselves, because they, I, you know, they know that tourism is important, but they also know the quality of their life is important. Well, I think there is this perception that why do we need a tourism authority to be marketing Hawaii? Hawaii is being marketed to death, that we have 10 million people coming here. It, it, you know, at, do we need to keep selling our, our state? And if so, to whom? Yes, but okay, go ahead. Please. <laughs> <laughs> uh, of course we do. 
<laughs> because we have new competition around the world and everyone, everybody wants to share that high spending leisure visitor. Also, when you talk about our competitive uh, places, uh, many of them are also business, San Francisco, New York, they're business centers. Hawaii is the most populated, uh, in terms of visitors, long haul destination in the world. So we have got to find people to keep on coming here, to spend more money here, reward the community with jobs and taxes, the thing that makes us grow. Um, and you can never take that for granted because the momentum factor in leisure travel of another area starts getting hot like the Caribbean or someplace else, you can see the focus shift, the airline seats shift, and we can't have them shift away from Hawaii. And I'm talking from a tourism growth standpoint, not a community you know, a, a viewpoint at, at that side. But uh, it always gets me nervous when we've had years of success as we've had since the downturn in 08 and 09, is that it's very typical. People say, oh, what, what is the number? It's too many. Um, I was in the governor's office after 9-11 and there was a, a, a service station owner for Manalo and he said, I did not know my business would be 40% down because there's no tourists coming. It's so just, everybody's so affected. I think the question that we really need to address from the <clears throat> community's perspective is tourism at what cost? You know, we see the social fabric of our communities being deteriorated. We're seeing the residential character of our neighborhoods being destroyed. There are many, many side effects and impacts of tourism. And this week, we had two incidents. One was the very tragic helicopter crash that happened in Kailua, that happened in a densely populated area where it could have been absolutely tragic loss of life. There are preschools nearby. There are single family homes. It's one of the oldest parts of Kailua. There's a high school nearby. And so I think, yes, people in the communities feel edged out. They don't feel like the tourism authority needs more money for marketing because social media is doing that for you for free. So I think the question of how do we do tourism effectively and how do we manage tourists effectively is very, very important. But I will tell you, when I spoke with community members, everyone said we need to put money into the natural resources, the things that make Hawaii our essence who we are and what people are coming for, that's where we need to direct the funds. And we need to direct the funds towards enforcement. In my community, we have so many illegal vacation rentals. It's what we hear about at the neighborhood board all the time. And it's really destroying the social fabric and it's disrupting the quality of life for our residents. And so, yes, I'm very thankful that you said you want to involve the community. I have many ways in how to do that. But um, yeah, this is a conversation that's very, very important. And it's not just about getting more resources. It's about how do you direct the resources and where do you put them? Well, Paul, how do we do that? How do we manage tourism? Yeah, I, I think it's important to understand that it's also not just a question of allocation of resources, which is an important part of what we're talking about, but the fact that management techniques can be developed that would actually create resources. So for example, if you have a technology which um, reduces the search cost for people looking for um, you know, trails to hike on, then the reduction in search cost alone increases utilization and creates the, you know, the negative externalities that, that uh, you alluded to. But at the same time, the same technology could be used to manage the utilization itself. And so we've been in a conversation with uh, DLNR, for example, about how to use the same technology uh, to manage um, trails. And in the particular case of the Diamond Head Trail, and I think they're talking about Manoa Falls, they're thinking they might uh, uh, deploy a pilot project to um, both gather revenue as well as the information that will help mitigate some of those um, you know, resource degradation issues that arise from heavy utilization. So I actually, when I asked uh, members of my community for their ideas, there were two that I thought were very interesting. One was an environmental tourist tax. So everyone who comes in has to pay a fee and then that goes into a special fund to help us manage and um, protect our natural resources, our beaches, our parks, our trails. The other idea that was very interesting to me was also for every marketing dollar that is spent on tourism, we spend an equal and equivalent dollar on 
taking care of our environment, taking care of our resources. And so those were two ideas that I thought were really great that came from the community. There's a lot of ideas out there. It's actually done. The tax is the TAT, and it's $600 million, of which $400 million goes to the, uh, the general fund. It doesn't come to tourism. It goes to the general fund. Um, that should be done to manage tourism and things you brought up. Um, and as far as in, uh, environmental spending, uh, the state spends about $100 million uh, from that general fund to go towards that. Is it enough? Absolutely not. It's not, not. enough. I'm not it saying it's enough. Not what enough. I'm saying is you are already taking a lot of the tourist money uh, through the TAT, through the GET. I think GET is six, six billion uh, and the, uh, on the spend and uh, TAT is 600 million. Let's That's lay, a ton of money. Let's lay out first for people who might not know what the TAT actually is, where it comes from, and, and how much it's bringing in. Sure. So the TAT is a, a tax that's put on all the rooms that are occupied, um, and it's 10.25 percent right now. And the last number I had was about 630 million that it brings in. Um, but I think your comments are, are really relevant because I think one of the first things we, I did when I got here is I met with um, Suzanne Case and the whole DLNR team. And we talked about how we can work better together because we have to, this is, our, you know, this is my home too. I grew up here, I raised my kids here. I want to make sure that we're investing in, because sustainable tourism isn't, is, is more than a word. It's how do you make sure that it's, tourism is still vibrant years and years down the road. And the only way you can do that is investing into the product, which is for us and with social media, it's all these trails. Everyone knows everything now. You know, all the old places I used to go to when I was a kid, they all know about them now. Right, there's no so, secrets But anymore. we have to invest in that, the, those, those resources. So we're working with DLNR, everything from not only investing on the trails um, and the beaches and the safety, um, uh, but also how do we educate the visitor about how important it is that when I go to, whether it be Monterey Trail or, or the pillboxes or anything, what you should and shouldn't do. What's the right thing to do? Because most people want to do the right thing. You just have to tell them what the right thing is. And that, that can be integrated in the same app that DLNR is deploying to, um, you know, for you to pay your admission fee and uh, for DLNR to track your movements and make sure you're not going off into the Kapu area or whatever. So it's important to understand that the, the deployment of such technology and management use does not necessarily require additional revenue or a different allocation mechanism, although both of those are possible. Um, uh, to Chris's point, the, the, the TAT, and then there's a transient occupancy tax on timeshares, both all of which is on top of the general excise tax, right? All of these different revenue streams and then individual and corporate income tax revenues, all of these streams go into a pot, the general fund, as Keith mentions, and how one allocates that is a separable question. It's interesting to have rules of thumb, like for every dollar here, you spend a dollar there, but there's no necessary connection. It's one way that, say, a legislative body could decide to deploy funding. Uh, but either way, I think the point we would all agree upon is that there hasn't been enough deployed in resource management and in sort of impact management. You mentioned cultural impacts and the you know, the fabric of the, the communities and the neighborhoods. These are all the kinds of things that come up, in, come up in surveys of how residents react to the presence and the growth of tourism. There hasn't that, been, in, in our opinion of what's happening on the ground, there hasn't been any regulation. We see on, on different social platforms, there are buses dropping people off at Monowilly, mm. even though the trail was supposed to be closed. There is trash on our beaches. There are microplastics on our beaches. There are homeless in our parks. So it's not translating at the community level. If there's resources available and you ask most citizens about it, they don't see where it is. And our trails are overrun. There is erosion. There is poop that floats by on Lanikai Beach. We have high bacterial counts. So it's not translating into things like water quality and our trails and uh, the very features that the tourists come to use. And so I think there has to be a better job done. And you know, I've heard that other places like Hyena State Park, 
They've now devised a system where you have to pay for tickets and they've created a parking lot. I know Haleakala does the same thing. So we may have to consider like a user fee oh, yeah. at places like the Pillbox Trail in Manawili. No. Well, I think if, it's totally reasonable. If I could to just bring up, because thanks for bringing up on, on the Kauai North Shore. So it was a t tragedy on the flooding that happened over there. However, uh, hopefully the, the community has gotten together and um, all, all segments, the county, the state, the community themselves, and uh, have put together, what are we gonna do about this? This is a park that was getting 2,000 people a day, and it's a one-way one bridge going off there. Yeah. And so, so they got together, and they, they, they came up with a solution that um, they would have a reservation system and uh, I was just so impressed. So they asked me to come over there. We met with, with the community leaders and, and the, and the uh, DLNR, Depar uh, Department of Transportation, and the county, and listened to what phenomenal thoughts and processes. There's still some discussions on what they want to do because you've got people who live there. You've got some vacation rentals in there. You've got some very sacred locations in there that they want to protect. But they've really come together, and they've, they've working through a process to where they said, it was interesting because they said, listen, are you concerned that we want to take it from 2,000 to 900? And I said, no, as long as the 900 have a great experience. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what we want. So they're putting together a, a, um, a reservation system, and it, will be, it may be a good benchmark for us moving forward uh, on how we can manage these locations to where the visitors have a phenomenal experience but we're respectful of the land and the people that live around there. We want them to have a wonderful experience. Right. And alongside, we want to teach them what it means to live aloha, what it means to malama the aina. And so in that sense, they take, I was thinking about this and I was thinking to myself, they take Hawaii away as a total experience or as an authentic experience <clears throat> instead of just something on their checklist. Okay, I did the pillbox, great. Okay, I did Manawili, great. No, they should come and be able to understand what it means to live alongside nature and how we live symbiotically. And so, you know, I think it's very important to educate the tourists. I hear all the time about, you know, um, take Kailua Road, for example. It's a tiny road and it's shared by strollers, runners, uh, tourists who are standing there with maps and then there's like two small lanes for cars and often like someone will dart out with their bicycle and then you have to swerve and just pray that you don't hit the oncoming car. So we need to educate them. One of the other ideas that came from my community was have the businesses educate the tourists and the visitors before they go out into the communities. These are the intersections where you have to be careful. Right. These are the rules of the road. So, you know, and our infrastructure is really suffering because of the impact of all of the tourists. Keith, I want to bring you in on this conversation. Um, uh, and we ha we're starting to get your viewer questions, and please keep them coming. The phone lines are open, and of course, we have social media as well. Um, John on Maui says, Maui depends on tourism. What will happen if there's a disaster and tourism goes away? I mean, there is this fine line with wanting to regulate the tourists, wanting to manage tourism, but also welcoming these folks because we do need them. Right. Um, you know, we've faced disasters in the past. Um, we didn't only have to deal with uh, tragedies here uh, and also tragedies abroad. It is a big issue. It is a big issue. It's why you have to build that momentum. People who have memories, as she, as she mentioned. When you look at repeat visitors, repeat visitors don't just come back because they got no place else to go. They come back here because they want to show their kids what they went through. And I mean, this started with you know the people who were stationed here during the war and then came back and got married, and people who watched Blue Hawaii and the people who watched TV shows. So we have that great ability to get repeat visitors. But you have to show them a great experience. You have to make sure they know they're welcome. And I think everything about our Aloha brand gets that out. But if there were this was a middle tidal wave and the islands were inundated with visitor areas. Yeah, we would have no business. We would have to start over. We'd be facing things like Puerto Rico faced a little bit uh, a couple of years ago. Um, you know, fortunately, we're part of a big government that can help us come back, but that is a big issue. Actually, people may not be aware of this, but ever since the volcano, the numbers have been falling. They oh. just stabilized the last month or so. But not of the big island. Which is really strange because, first of all, the volcano wasn't on Maui for a while. <laughs> right, well, so that was a problem of perception, right? Well, like, yeah. Absolutely. But social media and, and the CNNs coming in. Well, it's that crew for three weeks. <laughs> and there's the volcano <laughs> behind the yeah. newscaster. And, and in economics, we call it information right. asymmetry. People right. don't know as much about Hawaii as we do, Even, which goes to your point about you know, educating. 
but this this we're we're, we're actually living this year right. the experience of having a little bit of a pushback on the on the tourism volume that's showing up in uh, state revenue not having been as robust as was originally expected in the in the current legislative session and they all had to make adjustments to that uh, you know to solve that allocation problem um, so it's we're living it right now the okay. unemployment rate is actually higher today here in Hawaii than it was a year year and a half ago well Steve from the North Shore writes in if the visitor industry cannot make enough money with 10 million visitors what do they need to do to be profitable I, I toss that to you I mean at what point you the know 18 billion dollar question <laughs> I mean at what point do <coughs> we say okay this is enough people right are we going for 11 million is that the next benchmark um, or are we going for a dollar value and trying to bring the actual count down yeah you know we're in an interesting situation now um, you know historically there has been a, a, an unofficial cap on the amount of people coming here by the amount of legal accommodations that existed in the state of Hawaii um, the illegal um, vacation rentals is a challenge when you're talking about managing tourism not only is it impacting our neighborhoods but it's also opening up an unlimited um, inventory and you know when you're trying to manage any kind of business when you have no idea how much inventory you have you know it becomes an issue and so that's why it's really important um, I know that the legislature and the, uh, the the counties are trying to work on how can they ma manage that and, and, and control um, though uh, those illegal properties coming out someone asked me well yeah but we need the money but I said listen I can build a hotel in Lanika and make a lot more money that's not what we're looking for those are communities that we live in and that we raise our kids and all the things associated and then we have great resort communities districts that have great hotels great services safety and all the things associated so we have to figure out, or the, the, the community and the legislature and the, and, the, and the leaders have to decide, what do we want to be? Do we want to be a, a, a place where they can stay anywhere for vacation rentals? Or do we want to have a place where you've got, they can come visit, but they, they stay more in the resort areas, and then you have the vacation, you know, the, you have the, our communities where we live. And that's, that's a decision the communities need to make, not the platforms. So exactly, we should not cater to the platforms, but what I think as a community member is we should focus on upgrading the resort areas. Mm -hmm. Like I've heard Waikiki is really run down, so maybe we should mm -hmm. focus that on upgrading. That's awesome now. That was <laughs> one yeah, of the feedbacks I, 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 that I got. That one I'd have to. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So, but anyway, to your point about the vacation rentals, there was a very, very sad story uh, that I was told by a parent the implications are very far reaching. And what this parent said was on her street in Enchanted Lakes, three out of four properties, which were formerly long-term tenants, they were military families who were there for three to five years, they were integral part of the community, those homes got sold. And they were then turned into TVUs. And the impact was that the elementary school their enrollment, their elementary school in that neighborhood, the enrollment dropped by 17 percent. From so, three houses? Not just from those three <laughs> okay, houses, sorry. but Big in general. Big no, no, no. <laughs> to, my, to my point about yeah. the, um, the neighborhoods changing and shifting and us losing families and long-term tenants because of economic profit and the drive for revenue from vacation rentals, from TVUs. So the implications are very far reaching and how I see it ultimately up on the balcony is there's a loss of our human capital, there's a loss of our intellectual capital, and there's also a loss of culture because a lot of families are having to move away. So I spoke with two Kupuna this week who said their families have had to move to Las Vegas and they're saying, you know, my grandchildren don't even know what it means to be raised here. They don't know that aloha. So this is how it's translating in our communities. It's affecting our schools. It's affecting our neighborhoods. It's affecting our populations. But, yeah, but the other side of the energy is that this lady worked for me, May Dean. She lives in Waimanalo. She lives a block from the beach. She, built, she and her husband built a home for their daughter in the back uh, to raise her young kids. They did, and great. After the daughter moved out and went on her own, they had a couple in there from Australia, $1,500 a month. And OK, fine. Now she moved it over to a vacation rental unit. She gets two fifty a day because she's a block from the beach. She makes six thousand dollars a month, and she's putting her grandkids through college. You know, Maylene would be sitting here going, "I understand what you're saying, 
but I spend time with those visitors every day. I take them down to Wanano Beach. I teach them how to bodyboard. So from an industry standpoint, our view on the transit accommodations, I don't speak for everyone, mind you, but if it's hosted, mm. it's a good thing because you're going to get a cultural experience and you're helping family directly. So you're if talking it's somebody, about the B&Bs. You're not talking about the uh, entire no, house it, it rentals? Could, it could be a house rental, but it's got to be hosted by somebody who owns it and lives on the so property or nearby. Live. Not when somebody buys five houses and put them in a rental pool. So what if or they live in Kaneohe? Yep. What if they live in Kaneohe, but they, they have a house in Wamanoa? And do they go and host that group? Do they go and meet them in the morning and do things? Yeah. So then, I'm going to throw a bomb in here just to say, um, I'm pretty sure that undocumented vacation rentals in search of a pathway to citizenship are not going away. So if, if you just accept as a premise for a second that ride sharing is not going away and home sharing is not going away and in large part because we all live in Kailua and we're all thinking about whether we should be renting out a, a, a TVU rather than a short-term rental or whatever we have and that's the story of Kailua is everybody's got a rental. Um, that's just the city evolving and if we don't figure out a way to manage it then we've got to figure out a way how to channel it because you're going to have these situations like the one you described right. Keith where it's just local people trying to do something with their property and I, I, I'm kind of you know unsure what that path is but it's a perfect example of how right. you it's well, it's but I mean this a lot issue came yeah. up over and over again at the city council uh, and at the yeah. state I understand, and with but this the recent impulse, bill we have to enforce as an impulse never is the complete solution. So my guess is we need more housing in Kailua for the kids that have moved away, like mine. I don't know my but, but and I, There's I, a I, lack I, of the, in, there's not much of an inventory and there's a lack of affordable housing, but yeah. my point is, while the homes are being sold and there are big swaths of foreign investors yeah. in Kailua who are buying up homes and properties. Understandable. So yeah. that decreases the inventory. We're an island, we have a very limited space, we can't keep building. So we shouldn't be using them for vacation rentals in the first place. And I the think other thing what is, you're saying oh, is that they're here to stay. Like I'm we're, saying, we're not going to lose them. Yeah. But, but our, our, our analysis is, you know, and I agree with the, the person who's, especially if they've had their home forever and they want to rent a house in order to keep and pay their mortgage, moving on. And, however, all our analysis is more than 80% of these is not that way. They're, they're people who are buying full homes. Yeah. So renting them out, and it's, it, it's, it's a different business model. And I think, I think they have municipalities that have been able to manage it and have been able to do enforcement. And, we, and I think that right now, I think uh, the city council in Honolulu, Kauai and Maui and, the, and Hawaii Island have been working on that. Honolulu's got a couple bills coming up next week that, 85 and yeah, that could hopefully have an impact on it. So I think there is, but they ha there has to be something. But they're, they're all about caps. All the bills are about caps, and I'm talking about boundaries and guardrails, which is not mm. the same thing. If we just, I, we tried capping it, remember back in 89 mm -hmm. or 80s. something? And, right, Kylo had right. some vacation rental thing. So I, I'm just saying, I'm pretty sure that's not sufficient, that we're gonna have to be even more creative, and it might involve more housing development in a place like Kailua. I want to get to more questions because they're pouring in. And, and Paul, this is for you. This goes back. To, <laughs> this it's not goes, a good sign. This goes back to the report. Um, and Russell wants to know from Honolulu, how well have we managed the situation in the last 30 years? What could we do differently? Your your report sort of takes the long view. Well, we, we're we're focusing on a very important but narrower set of issues. So in in the report, we talked about marketing issues. We talked about strategic planning issues, which we haven't really talked about here. Uh, we talked about the, the management issue is kind of the big one, that is my big thing, there's an app for that. And then um, the fourth one would be, now I forgot, but, um, oh, this one for Chris, Rada. <laughs> Maybe we need like a department of tourism. Maybe the marketing management or whatever HTA is, and that's sort of the definitional existential question is one that we should also rethink is you know, you know not enough attention or maybe not enough resources or maybe not not enough importance in the economic governance structure of the state so, so giving that authority yes. more teeth yes yeah well maybe we have a department of agriculture that was created 100 years ago when agriculture was 60% of the economy then 
but we don't have a Department of Tourism. Because a big problem is interagency coordination, the issues we were talking about between the city and the management issues that it faces, the Department of Land and Natural Resources, a state agency that has other kuleana, the HTA, which has its assignment, you know, is that coordination management coordination occurring But do you think that, that right coordination level? would actually happen? Like I'm just thinking of a case where we often have citizens and nonprofits go out and collect trash on our beaches mm -hmm. and often they say, well, who do we call to pick it up? And it's like, well, you call this agency if it's here, but if you call this agency if it's near the water line and if it's a big net, you have to call this agency. And so there's a lot of volleying of the kuleana. Yeah. So I'm wondering if there is a head agency, doesn't that mean that it's going to be more bureaucratic? <laughs> <laughs> Are you willing to coordinate? Like, well, up I, I, I think yeah. to your point, I think, I think it's really important that we, do, that we do all work together. And it's no different than in the industry that I was in before. And that's why we've met with DLR, we meet with DOT. We, we have to, you know, we're a state agency. But and we should be using their resources as much as we can. Um, my number two attends all the department head meetings now with DBED. I think we can do a much better job. There's areas in, in, in the state that we can't just do it ourselves, even if we even if we have the funding. For example, the North Shore. You know, we know, all know living here the traffic challenges on the North Shore. How do you address that? But you've got you got to get with DOT, DLNR, and the counties who have the land out there. How do you how do you bring that together and that's what kind of things we're I'd like to really work on and how we can do that um, on Maui you got Hana Highway the challenge is there how do you but you've got a lot of different groups so it, I think it's going to be a coordinated effort I don't think there needs to be someone dictating it but I, I you know but everyone I've talked to they've been very very open to talking about how we can do better so wouldn't that streamline it I mean if, if you did have one authority that could sort of oversee all of it in a you know, the downside, as the guy who yeah, just brought I, this I up, was gonna say. <laughs> the downside is like, really, we need another state agency? Yeah. So that's, I mean, that's the yin and yang of it. We, we bring it up in the paper because we think it's worth tossing out there, but we, man, need, we need leadership. Yeah, you know, we need Big time. government leadership, yeah. a governor, a mayor, I mean, and they all do their parts, but there isn't enough as a part. Where does this go? With this 400 million that goes from the TAT that doesn't go anywhere to do with tourism, why isn't that being tied to specific objectives and goals, measurements. What do we want to have happen? And it's not the number of visitors, it's visitor spending. How do we grow our visitor spending without growing the number of visitors? It's really a goal or go build more hotels, as he said. We need well, leadership, we need coordination between agencies, we need political will. Another thing that I would like to see is I would like to see citizens and residents who are affected and impacted by these problems on some type of institutionalized board mm -hmm. who have voting power on decision making because they are the ones who are impacted by tourism. Yeah, just, just to so turn I would all love this, to see that. Just to turn all of this on its head. So really do town people know what's going on on the Windward side? Do the town people know what's going on on the Lever side? Maybe there's not enough attention and coordination and management right down at the community level. That's an old argument that in this, you know, in this state. But the community is a very powerful voice and they would like to have a seat at the table in something that is affecting their quality of life. Well, let's talk about those numbers. Uh, you know, we have, we have several people writing and Art and Ina Heine says, rather than talk about managing visitors, when are we gonna talk about a cap on the number of visitors? And Ron on Twitter says, is anyone on the panel aware of other states or countries that have successfully capped tourism? I mean, Keith, can we? No, that's ridiculous. I mean, literally ridiculous. Sorry. <laughs> Should we be managing how they impact communities? Yes. Should we be dealing with issues like trash on the beach and the number of people at uh, walking on various trails? But go talk to the owner of Leonard's Malasadas. There's a line all day long, and those are all tourists and looking at guidebooks. So overall, it's good for us. Do we need to manage it better? Yes. Uh, if we had some control over uh, what's going on on the uh, visitor uh, accommodation units that are you know, the ones that are just going crazy right now, we would be able to, one, get money from that, but two, start to put regulations on what can be done. And if a community determines they can't have more than one out of every four homes being a uh, transient unit, then that should be the community's right to do that. And, and the industry would agree with that. Um, so I don't think you can say such a thing as a cap, but you've got to manage your growth. And all the while, we cannot survive by arrival numbers. We can only survive by spending. 
Well, yeah. to Lavani's point about the environmental impact, we have two folks writing in here, and we try to get to as many of these as possible. Uh, Maxwell says, all the trails I used to go on as a kid here are devastated. I don't think it's possible for these tragedies to be avoided. Look at Hanalma Bay. It's going to be shut down, going to have to be just shut down to recover to what it used to be like. A caller from Honoka'a. Right a, a caller from Honoka'a on the Big Island can relate to this topic with the problems facing Waipio Valley and the damage to its community. How can HTA help to educate visitors to preserve our state? You know, we can definitely do a better job. We are, we, we've recently put together a, a number of videos and informational um, uh, uh, avenues to um, focus in on how they, how everything from microplastics to um, when people go in places they shouldn't go, and we need to do more on the education piece. There, there's no question about that. One of the things we did, again, I bring back Kauai because I think that that, that may be a benchmark. You know, they brought in these community, the community people, the, the, the government people, and then once they came up with what their solution is, then they brought in HTA and said, I said, you know, what can we do to support you? Because um, this should be not Oahu-centric decisions mm -hmm. for Maui and Kauai and, and, and the Big Island. Um, the challenges they have on the Big, uh, big Island, um, same conversation uh, the, the the representatives um, state representatives and the county need to get engaged and then let us know what 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 can we do to help because again it's the experience we've got to make sure it's an experience if I could throw one other thing out too it's really important besides the natural resources you know one of the one of the parts of the statue of HEA is perpetuating the Hawaiian culture and we just got to make sure we're going to add another million dollars to our budget this year on on trying to focus on the language and because all of that adds to the experience that if we can continue to work out not necessarily does everyone speak need to speak but that piece is important to us how we engage and work with that we're the we're the largest um, sponsor of uh, the Mary Monarch what a phenomenal experience so those are the type of things I think we've got to keep investing in in order to have that experience long term part of the mandate too I think of HTA is to focus on community desires that's correct so you know incorporating that community voice is important I also wanted to just give an example you know perhaps what we may have to do is to allow our natural resources to restore themselves and so that may mean partial closures sometimes to, you know, let our bird sanctuaries flourish, let our trails grow back. And I know they've done this in places like Maya Bay in Thailand, also Uluru or Ayers Rock in Australia, they've closed it to hiking because of its sacred cultural significance. So that may have to be part of the equation. We may have to look at that because we don't want to keep, with the increase in tourists, we don't want to keep overrunning our natural resources. Right, I mean, there's so a we need to restore them. Things are being loved to death, if you will. Let me throw an economic twist in here. You know, one of the reasons why we observe overuse in many of these cases, there, there's been a clear shift in recreational preferences towards these kinds of activities as part of the destination experience, and just in general in terms of lifestyle, active recreational, outdoor recreational lifestyles. But if you think about why there are too many people you know, on the road or on the trail or whatever, if the price is zero, there's always going right. to be too many people. So to your point earlier about user fees, and I don't want to give away any secrets, but there's these two Kylo boys that haven't, they already have an app, you know, they, I think they talk to your guys. Mm -hmm. They talk to DLNR, I know. So what I'm saying is if we can use the technology to actually employ user fees actively, dynamic pricing, so you charge more when it's congested and not as much when it isn't, then what signal does that send to the marketplace? It sends a signal to people like Cool Law Ranch or people that have private potential recreational resource opportunities to develop those resources into tourism or more generally for the public at large. But it could also send the signal that it's a high value commodity. Mm -hmm. Anytime you Absol have to pay absolutely. for something, it puts like a value on it. We, we already know that. So if people see they... these beautiful pictures of the Mokuluas because they yeah. went on the pillbox and they know that there's only 50 tickets a day that are sold, they'll probably be willing to pay for it because they want that iconic picture of themselves in front of the Mokuluas. But what I'm saying is that the, the, the issue with having to rest a, a you know, natural resource, recreational, um, resource, let's say, is it presumes that there aren't any more of them. And I'm thinking we could have more of them, that private providers of those services could be induced to be more actively engaged in it to reduce some of the loading on, on the, the public open access. 
uh, resource. And we're also talking about going back to the experience because we talked about the North Shore uh, on Kauai, but when we have had discussions with DLNR, and I think you have too, about they, they should really um, discuss charging in a lot of these locations. And there was a question, well, how will the visitor industry feel about it? And I said, they'll feel very good about it. If it's clean and the bathrooms are clean and the trails are being taken care of, everyone wants to invest into and it. And you have someone monitoring the site, so yeah. you provide employment. That's right. So I, I see you wrong. nodding, and I'm actually kind of surprised. No, of course not. <laughs> I mean, this is all over the world. I just was in Tanzania. You stop at a bathroom, you give, you pay a dollar to go. I mean, and the people don't have issues with that as long yeah. as it's a quality experience. Um, I, I think those things are great. Um, the concern I would have is make sure the money comes to the venue. Mm -hmm. You know, when they started TAT, it was to be funding tourism marketing, and. Two years ago, he got 70, uh, 82 million. This year, he gets 79 million. TAT went up 150 million. We have 51 million of the TAT going to the mass transit fund. How can that be? What does that have to do with anything for visitors, at least currently? Someday, maybe visitors will ride the train and you know, they'll be good because they'll take some traffic off the freeways. But should that money go to other things? Sure. Just don't, you know, don't stop the effort that's being done by HTA, but look at the money that's generated by tourists and go take that money and make the community better, make the bathrooms better, make the experience better. It has to be tightly regulated. <laughs> You've got to just make sure because what will happen with, the, with our legislature is they'll do it, they'll get it, they'll take it, and they'll put it in the general fund. Because why? Because right. our yes. economy is growing. Our cost of doing business in Hawaii is growing. That person that mentioned about putting a cap, Who's going to pay for the funds for the union pension funds? Who's going to pay for ongoing costs of fixing roads? That comes from the general fund in a lot of cases. That grows because the tourist is more tourist spending money. We want to grow more tourist spending, not just tourist arrivals, although the airlines And a share want has arrivals. to go towards repairing our infrastructure well, and, and because we're it. seeing such a uh, major use in places like Kailua and you know it wasn't built for that. And so you know, our roads are suffering, our waterways are suffering, we're having collapsed culverts. I mean, we're seeing all kinds of infrastructure problems because the built. population. There's more <laughs> restaurants being built that are requiring, that are relying right. on tourists. And finite Kailua space. has always wanted tourist money, they just don't want the tourists. Yeah, so here I'll throw another hand grenade into the. <laughs> I so don't know if they they always wanted the tourists. <laughs> I like tourists, no, but no, you know. Just, after they fix the polytunnel, <laughs> explain to me, since three of us live in Kailua, why do we get to, the, to drive through the polytunnel for free? Why do we get to drive through the polytunnel at rush hour for free? Who thought that up? I'm just saying, once you start going down the road of user fees, and once you start thinking about using the technology, right? It's all electronic. Well, it's user fees for everyone, user fees just for the tourists. I think hey, that people... Hey, you on the road, you're using hey, it, I so. mean, people who drive to oh, town to work might feel like they're already nickel and dime to death, I'm just right? saying, <laughs> are, are, we, or are we really on the road because it's free? So th this is a mm -hmm. much deeper conversation that we have to have, no question about it. But I think we're going to go down this road of pricing, and we know that te technology allows you to do it without a toll booth, and maybe even without an enforcement officer. Maybe you oh, just wave hi to the drone that's tracking <laughs> your phone. So we, you know, let's get creative here and get to a solution that allows for, um, you know, without having to go to the blunt instrument of banning people from being somewhere, which you can't really do anyway. But we should do this let's, expeditiously, not like this, you I'm know, 20 year vision yeah, statement. No, no. So, we need to do it now. So what we did um, uh, last month is we met with DLNR and we said, listen, we can, we can do, let's start doing pilots. How do we do this? So we set aside a half a million dollars for DLNR to do a pilot program of a, an ambassador at their highest use locations. And they're putting together the list and let's see how that works. So what does that ambassador do? The, the idea is anyone who's traveled and gone to the national parks, and you don't go to a park without there. Someone tell, there telling you about the park history, yeah. what you should, park rangers, right. So the idea would be you'd have people, and the ideal person would be someone who lives in that community that can talk about not only the history, but the do's and don'ts, and also, um, again, give them, give them an understanding of why it's important they do what they do. You know, don't go through the yard. You know, that, that type of thing. And like I said, most visitors, if they're told what the right thing to do, they'll do the right thing. 
So the idea would be is those major locations, and again, we're in Kailua, so we, I throw out like a Monte Willie Trail. So if so, there was someone there to talk to them about that and say, oh, I get it. Or, hey, yeah. you might not want to go up there today. You got a lot of rain going on. It's going to be really slippery. Make sure you got the right shoes. So that kind of thought process, educating the visitor, not only on the safety, but the historical value of those locations. So again, my bros who are making an app, so that there's an app for that that their whole idea is that would be in the app i'm just saying we may not have to hire somebody but to levon's point i don't know point, if people listen to an app in the same way they listen to someone that they look at face to face though yeah if it's a big brada from you know wamanalo <laughs> sure but look this idea that we need to get we need to get there fast i think is really important the same conversation that you guys had with dlnr i had with the trails and the parks guys and and they said pilot and I said, no, oh, brother, let's do it all. Yes. No, forget the, let's just leapfrog right to the end. So, uh, you know, the reality is somewhere, you know, somewhere between not doing it and, and going, you know, whole hog. But I think the general feeling is that we're all interested. We, in we should also going. be creating more things for people to do. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, my pet peeve for years is the Alawai Golf Course. I mean, you, you take a picture of Waikiki and Alawai, we have 23,000 workers here and 80 workers on the Alawai golf course. And I know those one, no disrespect to those wonderful retirees that play there every day, but why isn't that a nine hole golf course? And why don't we have a swimming complex that has events from around the Pacific, uh, both high school, college, collegiate events, we're the home of swimming. Why aren't we the home of all the beach volleyball? Why don't we have these type of events? Why aren't we the, the little league uh, baseball center for the Pacific with Asia teams coming and local teams coming? And put that at the LOI because the rooms are in Waikiki and these can go across the LOI and play there and create reasons and uh, for people to come here, but for people to stay and doing the things. And yeah, some of them may go on trails or whatever, but most of them are gonna be at these type of events. And it also promotes future visitors. We have a lot of space like that. We have LOI Golf Course. You got Jefferson Elementary School. You know, that could be something else with an event type that could be a waterway there where you have uh, rowing and different kind of events. If we created more of these for our visitors, our locals would get to use them. Our kids in schools would, the number one sport uh, for females for getting division one scholarships is rowing. We have no rowing here, but if we had more events for them to get training or whatever, our students could go and get scholarships elsewhere, but we need to create more of these type of venues. And we have the money. We have the TAT money to start to be, uh, it's got to be a private partnership, uh, private public partnership. But let's look at developing some of these as part of our management of tourism going forward so we're not sending everybody to the pillbox. People have an opportunity to do other things it created for them. Along those lines, I think there's also a new kind of traveler too, an aware mm -hmm. traveler. And so I would like to see authentic user experiences. So come and stay and work in Aloi, you know? Come and help us clean up our beaches. That way we can get things accomplished that we need to, to protect our environment and our ecosystem and people learn and they take that knowledge back with them. And so I would like to see authentic. Absolutely, diversified tourism. Okay. You know, look at Mauna Kea, what it could provide for tourism in terms of uh, kids who want to learn about astronomy. Look at what, uh, to Waipio Valley, go in and understand how taro grows and understand aquaculture and different things that go on here. Why not, you know, why not diversify into further other areas of tourism that take advantage of our base, our, our weather, our local spirit, the accommodations that are here, but you get to leave here learning something. What happens if you come back? It you sounds like back. you want that cabinet position that Paul was talking about. <laughs> <Yeah, no. laughs> Um, to Phil and Makiki, and, and these are pouring in, uh, I, I actually wanted to ask you this, Paul. Why aren't we spending more to get high-end tourists but less tourists? And this goes to the findings in the report I, talking I'm, about... I'm the wrong guy to ask this question. I have great faith in the marketing professionals, one of whom is a, a co-author, Frank Haas, um, and, and guys like Chris and Keith in the industry who... and I hung out at the marketing department at a bank, commercial bank for years and years. So I, I have faith that these people know what they're doing. I have no idea what they're doing. It, 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 when I look at the outcome, I don't see it in the aggregate. I understand the defense that had we not done the marketing we did, it might have actually turned out worse than it did. So I, I'm okay with that. I tend to focus on these other issues because I know more about them than I know about the mysteries of marketing. But um, two points I will make from an economic standpoint. One is that it's not possible to rely solely on private marketing, uh, partly for the reason that there is a coordination issue um, and um, partly 
for the reason that there is a, just as there are social negative impacts of private economic decisions involving tourism, there are social positive impacts of private economic decisions to say fly to Hawaii. And so for those two reasons, it's um, justifiable for the government to play a, a coordination role and also a role that helps keep the focus generically on destination marketing as opposed to individual property or individual activity. Create the demand and then industry does the call to action. But beyond that, I, it, marketing to me is a complete mystery. A, a good example would be groups. Uh, Corporate meetings, and we're not going to do a lot of social changes here, but corporate meetings incentives are high spending because both the company has spent and then the individual is spending when they're here and they about 80% pre and post. And you know, we build a convention center, great. And most convention centers lose money because you really want to find a way to generate offshore dollars, which is why the convention center was built to drive offshore dollars coming in through room nights and visitors coming elsewhere. But the legislature immediately puts so much pressure on them, the need to break even, that we have volleyball tournaments there now we have banquets we have car shows okay that's good because it is a great venue but it's there to drive room nights and we need to put more emphasis on that I was just doing the numbers on a five on a 5,000 room group with 10,000 attendees, uh, assuming spouses. Uh, the tax revenue from that is about $5 million. The convention center would probably charge $200,000 in rent. We shouldn't be charging rent. They should take that, that loss and drive the taxes in. Now that's an internal issue for us to manage, but as you go through some of these things, it really is the high spending visitor like groups, like the honeymooners, uh, people who spend money beyond just why they're coming here. You know, they're gonna have that big function, they're bringing other people with them. So it's there, and I think HCA and their, and their vendors have done a good job over the years. I mean, look what happened last year with, with the volcano and the hurricanes uh, and the hotel strike, I mean, on and on and on, and yet we're down right now, but we're not down and out. And, you know, there will be a rebound towards the second half. So the system is pretty good. Where the system fails is in the overall management of it because they have no power to try to manage stuff. But, but a, good, a good comment would be is, so we're just struggling a bit on Hawaii Island um, because of what happened last year. And we're trying to drive more business. And we put more resources towards it. But we're not gonna, we don't wanna make the same mistake twice. So as we put these fun, funds and resources towards marketing and, and promoting Hawaii Island, we will not do promote any any area that the community does not want people at because if we promote it they'll go so it's important that we have those conversations and we've had those conversations with them now some of the areas whether it be YPO Valley we can't control social media I wish I could but I can't so those are the ones that are going to be continue to be a challenge we're gonna to have to figure out the match but from our standpoint and what we promote we're gonna make sure we're only promoting what the community wants us to promote Hawaii Island's a little unique because they need the business. Some of the other markets, it's a little different. Um, everyone needs business, but th we, that's really where our focus is right now. Chris, we only we have talk a, to the yep. number one and two attractions in the state are the uh, Volcano National Park and number two is Pearl Harbor. And they both were closed and closed for part of the year and closed till August. How do we not have that happen? I, I'm, I'm saying you guys, it's no, your fault. No, 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 How no. do we as an industry, as a community, not have that happen? Well, there's two things. One is on the volcano side of things. I mean, we've relied on the volcano for Hawaii Island forever. And um, it's going to be a challenge moving forward. And, and this is a great opportunity for what we call it's rebranding. What is Hawaii Island? And we all know that we've lived here. It's much more than the volcano. There's so many things and great things to do. But we got to be. We got to make sure we're doing it the right way. So that's kind of our focus. Working with the with the, the folks in uh, um, on the Hawaii Island. What do we promote? What's important? And how? Because at the end of the day, we need to make sure that we continue these direct flights from Japan, which are the load factors are down right now. We got to keep those going. So that's important as we move forward. Um, for, as far as Pearl Harbor, you know, uh, we, we we did a short-term fix for Pearl Harbor when during the shutdown, and because w there's a number of reasons why we need to keep Pearl Harbor open. Not only is it the number one attraction, but it's the right thing to do. There's a lot of there, there's a lot of history. history people, it, it's it's a cemetery, and we got um, the challenge we have on right now at Pearl Harbor is we've got the dock that's not open, and uh, had multiple conversations with our representatives and. Uh, um, uh, national representatives. It's a lot more complicated than I really realize uh, because of what's below there and what they have to do to fix it. But they are moving forward, and they're they're telling me by August, hopefully that'll be that'll be completed. So that that's really a constant 
you there know, needs challenge. to be a long-term strategy because I always say nature waits for no one. Yeah, she th does her own happen. thing. Yeah. So climate change is coming and we will be impacted by that. And so we need to take that into consideration Agreed. in this industry. So. We have one minute left and Paul, I want to give you the last word tonight. So I'll throw out the one marketing uh, creative idea I've heard that really intrigues me. When, when you go to Disneyland and I, my wife drags me there all the time, <laughs> It's amazing how um, once you get back, you're still buying Disney stuff. <laughs> and that's a marketing challenge for Hawaii. Once people go home, I mean, ideally, we would just sell them stuff and they never came here. So <laughs> I'm just going to throw that out there. Maybe marketing and, and these pathways, you talk about social media and internet retailing, are a way to extend the reach of tourism, to, to continue the connection with our uh, communities and our culture. But not beyond the capacity. We definitely what? have to look at carrying capacity uh, and we don't want to overdo it. So. Fair enough. I'm talking about selling after the visit's over. After. Yeah. Prolonging the experience. All right, we'll leave it there. Thank you so much. Mahalo to you for joining us tonight. Of course, we thank our guests, Chris Tatum, President and CEO of the Hawaii Tourism Authority, Paul Brubaker, Pre Principal of TZ Economics, Keith Vieira, a Principal of KV and Associates Hospitality Consulting, and Lavani Lipton, Vice Chair of the Kailua Neighborhood Board. Next week on Insights, the Hawaii State Legislature has wrapped up its 2019 session. We'll recap the successes and the failures. Please join us then. I'm Yanji Denise for Insights on PBS Hawaii, Ahui Ho.